Thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a great pleasure to be here. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the events in Crimea. And I think everybody would agree that when, a little over two years ago, Putin sent these troops into the Crimean Peninsula in these unmarked uniforms uh, to take control of main installations there. This was the most consequential act of his 16 years in power. Uh, it certainly was if we focus on, on international relations, foreign policy. Uh, in a single uh, act uh, by annexing territory from a neighbor, uh, Putin undercut the political order that had existed in Europe uh, since the end of the Cold War. So it's obviously extremely important to understand to the extent that we can why he did this. And it's not just uh, an important question from the point of view of history. It's important uh, if we are to have any hope of anticipating uh, whether Russia uh, is going to do something similar somewhere else, whether Putin uh, at some point will send troops uh, to liberate, in quotes, uh, ethnic Russians in other countries uh, near Russia's borders. Now, uh, a little over two years later, uh, I would say the three main explanations uh, dominate uh, the discussion uh, over this. Uh, the first you could call uh, Putin the defender. So in this view, uh, Putin was really reacting to an increasing threat from the West, uh, to the encirclement of Russia uh, by NATO, which was expanding towards uh, Russia's borders, uh, and uh, he reacted uh, in fear that uh, after the fall of the Yanukovych regime in Kiev, uh, Ukraine was about to join NATO, uh, which he was determined to prevent. Uh, and so that's the explanation uh, for why he sent uh, these troops into uh, Crimea. So that's one explanation. Another explanation you could call uh, Putin the imperialist. And in this, in this version, uh, the idea is that Putin really from the start, from the very beginning, has not accepted the disintegration of the Soviet Union, uh, the loss of land and status that that implied. Uh, and uh, he has uh, always had a consistent plan, though often secret, uh, to try and recapture, regain the lands and the status that was lost. And so Crimea was simply the latest episode uh, in this gradually unfolding plan. So that's the second uh, image, uh, I would say. And the third, you could call Putin the improviser. And in this idea, uh, in this version, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's essentially that, uh, that, that Crimea was a victory of tactics over strategy. That Putin doesn't have a, a long-term plan of any kind. That he's very reactive. He reacts to events uh, in uh, ways that have consequences, and uh, that in fact Crimea uh, was uh, an accident that he stumbled into uh, in the heat of an intense crisis uh, created by the fall of Yanukovych. So we see these three ideas uh, in the press, in the public discussion. So which is right? Well, uh, the official line uh, isn't much help. Because uh, if you look at what Putin has said uh, since that time, uh, he, he has hinted really at all three of these explanations. You can find support for any of these three explanations uh, in his various comments. So first of all, uh, back in March 2014, when he gave a triumphant speech to the, uh, to the Russian parliament, uh, there were various things in his speech which sound like Putin the defender. So Putin said he had, quote, heard declarations from Kiev about Ukraine soon joining NATO. And he said that NATO sailors uh, were mostly wonderful guys, but he didn't want to have to visit them in Sevastopol, uh, from where their guns would threaten the whole of southern Russia. So this sounds like the, the, the fear of NATO expansion, the, the urgent 
uh, imperative of stopping uh, NATO uh, expanding right into Ukraine. But then in the same speech, he said various things which are quite consistent uh, with the imperialist image. So he said, uh, for instance, in people's hearts and minds, Crimea has always been an inseparable part of Russia. And he pointed out that he reminded uh, people that Crimea was the place uh, where in the 10th century uh, Prince Vladimir had adopted Christianity and also was the place where uh, Russian soldiers from, from the Crimean War are buried. And he said in losing Crimea to Ukraine in 1991, Russia uh, was not simply robbed, it was plundered. So this uh, sounds uh, like the real motive was to get back what he lost. Uh, to get back what Russia uh, had lost uh, at the end of the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, it sounds like an imperial agenda. What about Putin the improviser? Well, this can also be heard. And, and this was the line he took uh, <laughs> when I got a chance to ask him this uh, directly. This was at a reception uh, last October in Sochi. And uh, I had a chance to, to have a few words with him, and I asked, well, how did he decide uh, to send troops into, uh, to start the operation uh, in Crimea? Was it uh, something that had been planned for a long time, or was it a spontaneous uh, act? And he said, uh, not at all, meaning planned in advance. It was spontaneous. We saw what was happening in Kiev, and I made the decision. So he said, and he has said this in various other places, too. Uh, so in this version, uh, it was very spontaneous, it was reactive, uh, uh, it was prompted uh, by the fall of the Yanukovych regime. Now Putin has also suggested certain other motives. He said that uh, it was necessary for Russia to intervene to protect Crimea's Russian population against violent Ukrainian nationalists who supposedly were coming down to Crimea uh, to, to violently attack uh, the Russian population. Uh, supporters of, of uh, Russian culture in Crimea. And he's also said that it was necessary simply to respect the community's right to self-determination. And he also, when I spoke to him, uh, after, uh, after explaining how <coughs> it was a decision that he made uh, in the spur of the moment, he went on to say, well, of course, it wasn't a military operation. It was just necessary for us to make it possible for the Crimean people to express their will freely in a referendum. So, this is another uh, explanation that he's given, but I think the threat from Ukrainian nationalists in Crimea uh, was almost entirely fictitious, and uh, Putin had shown uh, very little uh, open interest in the Crimean self-determination in the, his previous 14 years in power, so I take those uh, explanations a little less seriously. So which one of the three main explanations is right, and of course it might be some combination of the three. Well, let's go through them one by one. First of all, was it a response to, to a feared uh, NATO expansion into Ukraine? Now, let me start by saying that I think it's certainly true that the expansion of NATO into Eastern Europe, uh, without more than token efforts to integrate Russia, to incorporate Russia. I think this did help poison the relationship between uh, Russia and the West uh, over the last 20, 25 years. So that's the case, but, and here just to show you uh, what it looks like from Russia uh, to see NATO expanding. This is the situation in 1982, the NATO countries in the world. Then in 1990, uh, East Germany, when it reunites with West Germany, uh, becomes part of NATO. This is agreed with Gorbachev. Then Poland, Czech Republic, uh, Hungary in 1999. Then more countries in 2004, more in 2009. Uh, and then discussions of possible further enlargement you see to Ukraine and Georgia there, right up against Russia's borders, as well as the Baltic states, which already are on Russia's borders. Uh, so I think this uh, dynamic uh, clearly has uh, had a very big impact on Russian 
thinking overall about foreign relations. Okay, but uh, uh, I should also say I, I do think that Russia is determined, that Putin is determined, and many others are determined to prevent Ukraine from becoming a NATO member. I think they are very serious about that. But was that really a key factor here? Does that explain what happened in Crimea? Well, if you look closely, there are some problems uh, with this argument. Most importantly, Ukraine was not heading towards NATO membership at that time. The Ukrainian parliament had passed a law under Yanukovych on non-bloc status. It had committed itself not to become part of any military bloc. And even if uh, the Ukrainian leaders had changed their minds, after all, Yanukovych was out, uh, a new opposition group uh, of politicians was in power, uh, and we might think, well, they could change the policy. Uh, after all, uh, President uh, Yushchenko, uh, previous uh, Ukrainian president, uh, did uh, consider, uh, did even move, try to move Ukraine towards joining NATO after the Orange Revolution. So that was possible, but even if that was the case, NATO was not about to invite Ukraine to join. So basically, uh, that battle had been fought at a summit of NATO in Bucharest in 2008. Here you see the leaders meeting. At that time, uh, President George W. Bush had been quite eager to provide uh, both Ukraine and Georgia with what was called a membership action plan, which was a concrete, the first step along a concrete path of steps towards full NATO membership for those two countries. Uh, some of the uh, East European countries were also in favor, uh, but Germany and France uh, were very strongly against, uh, and uh, they won. Uh, they insisted that there would be no membership action plan uh, for Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, at that summit, uh, Putin uh, threw a bit of a fit uh, insisted that it would be extremely serious from Russia's perspective if they were given a, a, a membership action plan, and they were not. Uh, Merkel was very, uh, very clear on that. So that battle had been fought and won ultimately by Putin at that time. And you see here, he's smiling. <laughs> and nothing had changed uh, in the years since 2008 in that regard. In two, in, October 2013, so just before these events uh, that I'm talking about, the Secretary General of NATO, General uh, uh, Anders Fogh Rasmussen, had said that Ukraine would definitely not be joining NATO in 2014. What about these declarations from Kiev about Ukraine soon joining NATO that Putin uh, claimed to have heard? Well, he neglected to mention one detail. All of these uh, declarations came after Russia had already seized Crimea. They were a reaction uh, rather than a cause of that. Now, well, having said all this, it still might be the case that Putin believed that Ukraine was going to join NATO quickly. But if so, then presumably he would have raised this in his talks with President Obama. It would have been uh, an important issue on his agenda with the West. Was it? Well, this guy is Michael McFaul. He was Obama's special advisor on Russia from 2009 to 2012. And then he was US ambassador in Moscow from 2012 to early 2014. And he says that he was present at all the personal meetings between Obama and either Putin or President Medvedev when Medvedev was president. And when he was in Washington as, as uh, Obama's advisor, he listened in on all the phone calls uh, between the Russian leaders and Obama. And he says that in all those exchanges over the course of five years, Quote, I can't recall once that the issue of NATO expansion came up. Which does not seem consistent uh, with this being 
an issue that Putin uh, really uh, wanted to push in his uh, confrontations or, or negotiations, whatever they were, with the West. Okay. Now, this guy is the commander of the Russian operation in Crimea. Uh, his name is Alyek uh, Yelovinsov. I'll tell you a little bit more about him in a minute. But uh, in January, I went to Moscow uh, to do research for this. Uh, uh, this. I should say this is going to come out as an article in the magazine Foreign Affairs uh, in about three weeks. Uh, so if I speak too fast or anything, then you can always... Uh, read it there. But so I went to, to, to Moscow to do research, to talk to various people uh, after having, reading everything I could find about, uh, about the Crimean operation. Uh, and I was able to speak to a source uh, in Moscow who knows Bielovitz of the commander well, and who is familiar with the details of the operation. And I asked him, in, in the months before the, uh, before the operation began, were Russian uh, decision makers afraid of Ukraine joining NATO? Was this something on their minds? And this is his answer. He says they weren't afraid of Ukraine joining NATO, but they were definitely worried that the Ukrainians would cancel the lease on Sevastopol and kick out the Black Sea fleet. Now, Sevastopol uh, is uh, the city in, uh, on the Crimean Peninsula uh, which has a port where the Russian Black Sea Fleet, as well as the Ukrainian Black Sea Fleet, uh, is stationed, or most of it is stationed there. And this is an extremely important uh, naval base from the point of view of Russia's military planners. It's really important for projecting uh, military force uh, into the Black Sea and, and into the Mediterranean beyond there. And uh, there had been, so, so Russia leases uh, the base at Sevastopol from Ukraine. There had been negotiations over it uh, a few years before under Yanukovych, and Ukraine had signed an agreement with Russia to extend the lease until uh, 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 2042. So they had another 25 years. But uh, at that time, at the time of the negotiations of this uh, lease extension, the Ukrainian opposition politicians uh, had been very critical of Yanukovych uh, for extending the lease. And now Yanukovych was gone, uh, the same opposition politicians were in power. Uh, so there was reason uh, to be concerned that they might want to, to, to renegotiate. They might refuse at this point to extend uh, the lease on the base. So this does seem very plausible to me, that this was a key consideration. But still, uh, the response that Putin chose uh, remains, to me at least, puzzling. Because by annexing Crimea, uh, he created for himself a, a series of uh, quite extreme costs. The international isolation, economic sanctions, but the reinvigoration of NATO, uh, which Russia, as I said, was concerned about, and alienation of most of the Ukrainian population. All of these things uh, seem like, uh, make, make intervening in Crimea and annexing Crimea seem to me like a very extreme response to what was a real, but probably manageable threat. Okay, so, so much for uh, fear of NATO expansion. Being, being the driver, uh, and I'll come back to this issue of Sevastopol. What about the argument uh, that in the in invasion, the annexation of Crimea was really part of, of, of this imperialist master plan uh, that Putin had been working on for years uh, and rolling out uh, cautiously uh, and sometimes not so cautiously? Well, it's almost too easy to make this case if you look at the things that Putin uh, and others have done over the years. So this, this is a very compelling case when it's presented by itself in the, in the press without any of the other details. So Putin, uh, after all, said a uh, quotation that's been repeated many times that Soviet disintegration was the greatest geopolitical 
catastrophe of the century, the 20th century. He also, uh, this is again 2008 at that Bucharest uh, NATO uh, conference, in private conversation with, with uh, President Bush, uh, he said at one point, you have to understand, George, Ukraine is not even a state. Then in 2008, uh, Russia invaded Georgia and then recognized the independence of two uh, regions, border regions of Georgia, Abkhazia, and South Ossetia. And uh, at that time and, and since, Russia has handed out Russian passports to Crimean residents, uh, which of course creates a pretext for possible intervention later. One can say that one is intervening to defend one's own citizens. So all of that looks very consistent with this idea that it was, uh, that there was an underlying imperialist agenda, and that was what uh, was driving events in Crimea. And there are other more, more specific signs that the Crimean operation was planned uh, in the months before February uh, 2014 when it began. For instance, in September 2013, uh, Putin appoints uh, Vladislav Surkov, who's his political guru uh, for many years, uh, to uh, take responsibility for, among other things, uh, relations with Ukraine. And Surkov, over the next few months, repeatedly visits both Kiev and Crimea. When he's down there in Crimea, Surkov, uh, among other things, discusses a project to build a bridge over the Kerch. Strait, that's the small uh, span of water that separates the Crimean Peninsula from the Russian mainland. And uh, if you're going to annex a penins peninsula, uh, you really want to have a reliable way of getting there. Uh, transportation uh, matters a lot. And uh, so they really needed a bridge to get directly from Russia to Crimea if they were going to do this. And so he's negotiating about this bridge. Okay, looks, looks pretty suspicious. There are also reports that a group of Russian police and security service officers uh, are visiting Kiev uh, during that winter, went on several occasions. Then in late 2013, uh, this guy, uh, Vladimir Konstantinov, who was the chairman of the Crimean parliament, uh, he goes to Russia, goes to Moscow, uh, and uh, meets there with uh, some of Russia's top officials, including Russia's top security official, uh, Nikolai Patrushev. So a lot, of, a lot of pieces that seem to fit together, right? To, to make an imperialist conspiracy. But uh, if we look a little bit closer, uh, there are some questions about this interpretation. So if Surkov, uh, the political guru, was Putin's point man preparing the Crimean invasion in late 2013, then why did Putin take him off the case? in late February 2014, exactly as the Crimean operation begins. Uh, he he, he uh, reassigns uh, Surkov, and uh, in March, uh, we see that Surkov has time to attend uh, a gallery opening in Moscow. Uh, you know, it's amazing what one can discover with Facebook these days. <laughs> a gallery opening in Moscow. He publishes a short story. Uh, of course, he could have written that before, but it gets published then. And he even has time uh, to take a quick uh, vacation in Sweden with his wife, uh, just before he appears on the sanctions list, the EU uh, list of people who aren't allowed to travel to Europe anymore. Okay, so he's not uh, sitting at his desk uh, in Moscow even, or and definitely not in Simferopol in the Crimea, managing this, uh, this invasion. So why, why that? doesn't make a lot of sense. Best explanation is that Surkov's job, uh, up until February 2014, uh, was to keep Yanukovych in power. That was what Putin wanted him to do, uh, to, to, to shore up the regime there. And he failed. And Putin was not happy about that. What about the Russian police and security service troops that were visiting Kiev? Well, they also were probably focused on the events in Kiev. Uh, they were, I think, advising Yanukovych on how to crush the Kiev demonstrations, to crush the Maidan, uh, and not planning the Crimean invasion. What about the bridge 
over the Kerch Strait. Okay, is this a sign that Moscow was planning to annex the region, that Surkov was, was working on this uh, shortly before? Well, in fact, negotiations over building this bridge had been going, going on for 10 years. Uh, and uh, in 2010, Yanukovych had agreed to the bridge, he'd signed a, uh, an agreement with uh, then-President Medvedev, and since that time, the Russians had not even managed to complete a feasibility study for the bridge. Which doesn't sound, uh, doesn't sound like the sort of behavior you would expect of, of people who are planning to invade and annex this territory. Did Putin expect Yanukovych to fall? Well, in December 2013, as part of this deal at the last minute with, with uh, Yanukovych to get him to say no to the Europeans, to, to uh, decline to sign the, the uh, association agreement with the European Union that he was supposed to sign. Uh, in return for this, Putin had uh, promised him money. And he paid a $3 billion loan in the first installment of this money to the Ukrainian government uh, that December. Now, had he suspected that the regime was going to collapse, he could have postponed making that $3 billion payment, and uh, even to Putin, uh, $3 billion is quite a lot. Uh, after Yanukovych fell, there was no real chance of getting that money back. Kiev defaulted on the debt in 2015. One, as one former Kremlin advisor told me, or as he put it, uh, it's not Putin's style to make such presents. So if he had been planning at that point for things to unfold as they eventually did, he would have saved his $3 billion. So until very close to the end, it seems to me that the Kremlin was counting on, on Yanukovych's pro-Russian regime surviving, and it was only really in the last few days uh, before the end that they began to realize that that was not going to happen. What about the third image? Was this uh, an improvised reaction to a crisis, a kind of accident that Putin stumbled into. Well, the strongest evidence against the idea that it was a long-planned uh, imperial expansion, uh, the best argument against that is the chaotic way in which the Crimea operation unfolded. Now, the military part was quite smooth, perhaps not so surprising given that the Ukrainian troops were ordered not to fire, uh, but these things are quite unpredictable, so uh, it, it, it was definitely a success militarily, you could say. But the political side, another matter. So how did this take place? What, what happened politically in Crimea? Okay, so this is based on, on what uh, my source, close to the commander, Bielovensev, told me about the details. Uh, this, I understand, I believe, came from Bielovensev himself. Now, Putin has said that, this all, that he gave the first order on February 23rd. February 23rd, uh, Yanukovych had fled Kiev, uh, and uh, that night from February 22, 20, 22nd to 23rd, uh, the Russian special services uh, managed to track down Yanukovych, get him out of the country, save his life uh, in, in their story. And after they'd done that, Putin uh, told his, uh, his security chiefs, that they need to start working on, uh, on, on intervening in Crimea. So he says February 23rd. According to my source, uh, already on February 18th, this is before Yanukovych uh, left Kiev, Russian special forces in the south in Sevastopol, in Crimea itself, and in Novorossiysk, which is in southern Russia nearby, uh, were put on alert. That's February 18th. Then February 20th, these special forces uh, get an order from Putin uh, to move into the main part of Crimea to blockade Ukrainian military installations and to prevent bloodshed between pro-Russian and pro-Kiev groups. It's called a humanitarian action. Uh, and uh, although this is inconsistent with what Putin has said, it's, uh, it is consistent uh, with uh, a detail that was reported on in the Russian press, which is that participants in this operation received medals and on the medals, it said the dates of the operation, and the starting date on the medal was February 20th. 
Now, as best I can tell, uh, these troops did not actually do any blockading of buildings or installations until at least February 23rd or February 24th, after Yanuko Yanukovych had fled Kiev. So it's, it, I think, was possible that Putin could still have called off the operation uh, if the last-minute agreement between Yanukovych, the opposition, and foreign ministers of the EU, if you followed the, what was going on in those last days, if that last-minute agreement had held. And there were some signs that Putin wanted that agreement to, to hold. Under that agreement, uh, Yanukovych agreed to step down early, to hold early elections, but not the next day, as turned out in fact. But that, that agreement fell apart. Uh, still, uh, we can, uh, the fact that there was no actual military action other than getting in place before February 23rd or 24th could be consistent with Putin, uh, you know, starting it but waiting to see whether to go for it. It's on February 26th to, 20, to, to 27th uh, that the real military action begins. Then people start noticing these uh, Russian, as they were called uh, in Russian, little green men uh, taking control of the Crimean Parliament building uh, and other installations around the peninsula. Okay, so that's what happened. And meanwhile, uh, as this was going on, on February 22nd, uh, Oleg Bielovyentsev, the commander of the Russian operation, arrives in Crimea. This is Bielovyentsev. Uh, he's a former spy, uh, a longtime aide to Russia's defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, uh, trusted by Shoigu. Uh, but he doesn't know very much about the Crimean political scene, uh, as becomes evident. So he arrives there February 22nd, and starts talking to people. He persuades the, the, the uh, incumbent uh, Prime Minister of Crimea, who is a Yanukovych uh, appointee called uh, Anatoly Magilyov, to resign. Uh, this guy is unpopular, uh, he's uh, viewed as corrupt, an outsider. And uh, Bielovyentsev promises the job to an old communist called Leonid Grach, uh, who's been known in Moscow since the Soviet era. He, he was in the last Soviet government uh, in, in the region before. Uh, so everybody knows. So, so uh, Bielovinsev uh, visits him and tells him, you're going to be the Prime Minister. Uh, we, need, we need you. However, uh, the next day, uh, Bielovinsev uh, talks to other people, and he realizes that Gratch has alienated all the local power brokers <laughs> over the years. So he has to call Gratch back uh, the next day to say, sorry, he's made a mistake. Uh, he's not going to be Prime Minister after all. Uh, sorry about that. And uh, Bielovitsa then chooses a local businessman, former boxer, called Sergei Aksionov, uh, with the underground nickname Goblin, uh, and he becomes the Prime Minister. And then, uh, this is days after the, the military intervention, it becomes clear that the Russians, that Putin, uh, really doesn't know what they want to do uh, with Crimea. So first of all, February 27th, uh, it's announced that Crimea is going to hold a referendum. That's the re referendum is going to be on May 25th. And uh, the question is going to ask respondents if they agree that, quote, that, that Crimea, quote, is a self-sufficient state and is a part of Ukraine on the basis of treaties and agreements. That is, uh, do they agree that there should be stronger autonomy for Crimea within Ukraine? That's February 27th. Then March 1st, uh, the authorities move forward the date of the referendum uh, to March 30th, from May 25th to March 30th. <coughs> then five days later, March 6th, they move the date of the referendum up again, this time to March 15th. And the question has changed. Now the question is going to be, are you for the unification of Crimea with Russia, with the rights of a subject of the Russian Federation? So Putin has changed from initially favoring autonomy within Ukraine to favoring outright annexation. And it's fairly clear that, that the real decision making is taking place in, in uh, Moscow, in the Kremlin. Uh, for instance, hackers got into the uh, email communications of the Kremlin officials and they, they find the documents 
uh, there uh, in their emails before uh, being announced to the public. Okay, so, so Putin changes his mind very quickly about what the status of Crimea is supposed to be. Now, all of this does not seem to be very consistent with the existence of a long prepared plan uh, for annexation of Crimea, for imperial expansion. Any competent imperialist, it seems to me, would have known uh, whom he wanted to appoint as the local satrap, would have known whether the plan was for locals to vote for autonomy or to vote for annexation. And he, a, a competent imperialist would have built a bridge to the territory rather than fiddling around in planning for 10 years. Uh, now, so, so all of this uh, suggests to me that there was not a systematic plan to do this in advance. Obviously, there are mili military contingency plans for all sorts of things, but a, a, a serious, uh, comprehensive plan, both military and political, uh, and an agenda uh, to take over Crimea. Now, that doesn't mean that no one in the Kremlin has imperial impulses. Clearly, some do. Uh, but that's not the same uh, as a concrete agenda, a concrete plan. So why did Putin raise the stakes from autonomy to annexation in this very brief period between February 27 and March 6? Well, one factor was that the Crimean elites uh, were very eager to become part of Russia. They didn't want to be left as a little abandoned, uh, semi-recognized statelet like Abkhazia or South Ossetia uh, with uh, economic problems, uh, with you know, problems getting their passports recognized uh, around the world uh, and shunned by the West. Uh, as Konstantinov, the chairman of the parliament, said, that would be pure adventurism uh, which would ruin us all. So they were, they were not at all eager uh, for that outcome. But I think uh, more importantly, Putin found that having plunged in, having taken the initial decision, there wasn't a viable exit strategy. So if we think about it, if Russia, after the troops intervened, if Russia had uh, simply withdrawn, taken its troops out, Ukraine could then prosecute Russia's supporters in the region. And at that point, it's very plausible that it would have canceled the lease the lease on the basis of a storm. This would have, uh, it would have been a disaster from Putin's perspective, and it would have made him look extremely weak. That's if Russia withdrew. Now, if Russia stayed, if the Russian troops stayed in, in Crimea, uh, then uh, they would have to do something about the 22,000 Ukrainian troops that were also stationed in the region. If you leave them there, then there's constant potential for uh, violent uh, confrontation. Now, if Russia expelled these 22,000 troops by force, uh, the Western response, uh, the Western condemnation would be almost as strong uh, as in the case of outright annexation. So there was not very much to be gained from that. So what could he do? Uh, I think uh, he, he chose what seemed to be uh, the least bad option at that point. So summing up uh, what I've argued, uh, it seems to me the most plausible interpretation is the following. First of all, Putin, uh, like most people, didn't think that Yanukovych uh, was going to be overthrown until a few days before the end. And he was working actively, doing what he could to try and, uh, and prolong the Yanukovych regime, although uh, many people in Moscow have told me that they and others were getting very alarmed about Yanukovych's behavior in the weeks before the end. I would say Putin, uh, my guess is that Putin then panicked about the possible loss of the Sevastopol base for the Black Sea Fleet, and he ordered the troops to take action in Crimea, uh, in my view, without having, first of all, worked out the most basic elements of the political strategy, so that we see this kind of uh, leadership musical chairs, they don't quite know who's going to be the leader, they don't quite know what the end status is going to be. 
Uh, he did it without having planned a way to exit, and I think also without having uh, ac accurately calculated, accurately estimated the medium and long run costs. After the intervention, he decided on annexation. Uh, so that wasn't uh, necessarily implied by the intervention, but it, it, it followed it in fact. He decided on annexation despite the costs because at that point he didn't see a better option. Okay. If I'm right about that, what are, what are the implications? Uh, what does that mean for how we should uh, understand Putin and his decision making and uh, think about possible future uh, Russian actions? Well, one thing uh, that's clear if this view is right is that the, the disastrous uh, development of relations between Russia and the West uh, over the last uh, two years might have been avoided. Uh, I can't say that with certainty, but it might have been avoided uh, if uh, the leaders of Ukraine, including the opposition leaders, and including their backers in the West, had consistently uh, promised to extend the lease of the, the base in Sevastopol uh, for Russia. What else? Well, it might seem reassuring, if I'm right, that there's no real imperial agenda in the Kremlin, uh, and that is, Russian leaders can live with NATO in its current uh, boundaries. It's not that they're uh, inevitably going to fight wars uh, to roll NATO back. That might seem reassuring, but don't be too reassured, because uh, in my view, Putin has started gambling. This is not something that he did uh, really before 2014. But now he's started gambling. Since Crimea, I would say that he's gambled in uh, Donetsk and Lugansk, so the eastern Ukraine supporting and stimulating an uprising there. He's gambled by sending the air force into Syria. Uh, and he also, I would say, gambled in escalating the conflict with Turkey uh, after Turkey shot down a Russian bomber. In all those cases, uh, rather than accept a possible uh, loss, he doubled down. He took more risks, uh, and in, in some, uh, from some uh, perspectives, really pretty uh, strange risks to be willing to take uh, for the benefit that uh, was uh, likely to come out of it. Now, I think it may actually be harder for the West to deal with somebody who's gambling, uh, who doesn't calculate the costs and benefits in a way that we can predict than it is to contain and deter a leader who is simply set on imperial expansion. If you know that's the goal, then uh, you can work on containment. Uh, if you don't know what risks he's willing to take and where, it's much harder. Now, if it was, as I believe, the fear of losing the base in Sevastopol that triggered the intervention, then we need to try and anticipate uh, what other Russian strategic assets elsewhere uh, could uh, prompt Putin to similar steps, uh, which are going to look significant enough to him that if they're threatened at some point, uh, he could take action. So looking around the world, well, uh, a good piece of news. There, there aren't any Russian bases in the Baltic states, so there's nothing directly comparable there. There is a naval base in Tartus, Syria, which we read about in the papers quite frequently, but it's very small and undeveloped. Uh, it's really not something uh, that I think Putin uh, is likely to, to fight for uh, if it comes to that, uh, unless, of course, the Russian military have big plans for it and, and it's now being incorporated uh, into their thinking in a major way. Uh, but I know they are trying to modernize it, but we should bear in mind that, that presence is. It's pretty small and insignificant. I think what could be more significant uh, is the Turkish Straits. So to get out of the Black Sea, you have to go through this narrow strip uh, of, of uh, ocean, uh, which is controlled by Turkey. So I think we should expect a major crisis if at some point uh, during a confrontation uh, with Russia, which uh, is much more likely now than it was before the shooting down of the Russian if during the crisis Turkey tried to close uh, 
uh, the Turkish Straits uh, to Russian ships, merchant ships, and naval ships. Uh, that would make it harder for, at this point, uh, uh, Russia to supply uh, its uh, remaining forces in Syria, and it would make it impossible for it to operate in, in the Mediterranean. Now, uh, under international law, there's a, a convention uh, under which Turkey is allowed to do that. If it's a situation of conflict or imminent conflict uh, with Russia, uh, but I think uh, that's the sort of thing which could prompt a, a uh, perhaps unexpectedly uh, robust response from the Russians. Thank you.